Released in March of 1996, Resident Evil helped solidify the survival horror genre. While the use of the occult and other motifs for horror have been used in video games since their start, there never was a specific genre wholly dedicated to it. Much of what the first Resident Evil introduced or reinforced would go on to lay the groundwork for what survival horror is and create a base work for each subsequent game in the series. Having come out around the dawn of the 3D gaming era, Resident Evil took many interesting and intelligent approaches to game design in order to create the first in a long line of successful and enjoyable games. After starting up a new game, the player is prompted to select one of two scenarios, either Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine. Multiple scenarios gives the game a good amount of replay value, as even though both paths share a similar story, how they go about it is slightly different. Jill has less health than Chris, but to compensate for this she has more item slots. Chris on the other hand has more health than Jill, which helps in surviving encounters, but is hindered by having to face slightly stronger and more numerous enemies. Each character also has an NPC partner. For Jill, this is Barry Burton, and for Chris, this is Rebecca Chambers. Both NPCs have their perks and help the player solve puzzles, but Barry is arguably the better of the two, since he tends to help Jill skip certain areas of the game, while Rebecca tends to serve as more of a tool for required puzzles. Barry gives Jill early access to the shotgun on top of helping with a full phase of a boss fight, while Rebecca serves as the only way for Chris to solve a piano-themed puzzle that Jill is able to do on her own. Because of this, Jill's scenario serves as a good introduction to the game and its mechanics, while Chris's acts like a hard mode. It's odd then that the game defaults to Chris's scenario over Jill's. I imagine a lot of people's initial frustrations with this game came from playing the harder scenario first, but there's so much more underneath that makes it all worthwhile. Bizarre murder cases have recently occurred in Raccoon City. There are outlandish reports of families being attacked by a group of about ten people. Victims were apparently eaten. Bravo team went to the hideout of the group and disappeared. Resident Evil's plot is fairly simple. A strange series of murders begin to happen up in the mountains outside of Raccoon City, and a special police force unit called STARS is sent to investigate. STARS is split into two teams, Alpha and Bravo. Bravo team is sent in first, but after a day of no contact, Alpha is sent to find them. A crashed helicopter and a few scattered limbs later, Alpha Team finds themselves running from a pack of wild dog-like creatures into a nearby mansion. The mansion is also overrun by strange zombie-like creatures, and it's up to the few remaining members of Alpha Team to locate their missing comrades and secure a way out of the mysterious home in the woods. As much as I wish I could ignore it, the opening cutscene is one of the key components of establishing mood and style for the game. Resident Evil's visual direction feels really unclear, as the style it presents itself in tends to jump around a lot. The first cutscene is live action, which presents itself with questionable acting and even more questionable character introductions. Chris Redfield. Jill Valentine. There's only one other live action section in the game, and that's the ending. The other choices for presentation are three pre-rendered cutscenes that happen at weird intervals, and the rest of it is left to real-time cutscenes that make use of the in-game's assets and visuals. It's jarring to say the least, there's no consistency between the in-game graphics and how the cutscenes play out. Now while I'm on the subject, the graphics for this game haven't aged very well. While I think the pre-rendered backgrounds in Resident Evil are some of the best looking things on the PlayStation, everything else is just eh, which happens to a lot of games that try to aim for a more realistic style. Back in the day, this game was horrifying, though, with its then high-quality cutscenes. But now it falls into that uncanny valley that a lot of other really early 3D poly games have as well. There's also another problem in how Resident Evil presents itself, and that's in its writing and acting. While bad voice acting is no stranger to mid-90s games, when combined with bad writing, it brings about some really cringeworthy moments. To demonstrate my point, here's just the audio from a cutscene in the game. Okay, let's separate again. Just a moment. I found something. What is it? It's a weapon. It's really powerful, especially against living things. Better take it with you. But how about you, Barry? 
I have this. Thank you. I'll take this then. And now here's the same sequence with the accompanying video. Okay. Let's separate again. Just a moment. I found something. What is it? It's a weapon. It's really powerful, especially against living things. Better take it with you. But how about you, Barry? I have this. Thank you. I'll take this then. You know, I think this cutscene makes less sense with the visuals, and that's because I'm highly inclined to believe Capcom really didn't consult with their US branch when they created the character dialogue for this game. Richard! What happened? Oh, Jill. This house is dangerous. There are terrible demons. Ouch! I've heard some people state that the game's dialogue is intentionally bad and corny to mimic old B-grade horror films, and there's certainly a lot of evidence to support that in future games, but I don't agree. Somewhere under all this mess, I feel like there was supposed to be a serious and interesting plot, but it gets mired by writers trying to create something in a language they aren't familiar with. The fact that even the Japanese version of this game only has an English audio track supports my theory. I've heard Capcom chose to stay away from a Japanese audio track for this game in order to make it feel more authentic. You know, American cops and American setting and all, but the reality is that the finished product is anything but that. So now that I've pushed the two elephants in the room out of the way, let's talk about what this game does right. When Resident Evil launched, Capcom penned the term survival horror to describe the genre that the game falls under. Horror and survivor horror are things that should not be confused. Horror is a genre that deals primarily with the occult. It's a description of content, things like vampires, mummies, or Frankenstein monsters. Survival horror, on the other hand, deals with gameplay and using the element of player interaction to get an emotional response, typically fear or tension. To put it in perspective, it's like how Devil May Cry is a horror game because of its visual design, but it isn't a survival horror game because its gameplay doesn't revolve around instilling tension in the player. At, at least not in the sense I'm talking about here. Now that we've defined what survival horror is and what it does, how do you make a video game scary? Most of what creates feel in any game is scenario design. Not to be confused with story, scenario revolves around how the player interacts with the game world and how their movement is perceived by the designer. To make it a bit easier to understand, story is the narrative of the game, things like cutscenes and exposition, and scenario includes things like what monsters the player can encounter or what direction the player has to go to advance the game. One of the biggest components of Resident Evil's scenario design, though, is how it controls. Despite a lot of the trouble many developers had moving into the third dimension, Capcom's approach to Resident Evil is quite smart. One of the defining aspects of Resident Evil, as well as other survival horror games, is a fixed camera. A fixed camera helps guide the player's eyes in a way the designer wants them to see things. From a tension-building perspective, this gives the designers more leeway with where they can place items or enemies. It's easy to get the player to focus on an item when you can have the camera zero in on it, and likewise, it's also easy to hide an enemy behind a wall, making it so the only way you know they're there is to hear a growl or moan, and this is an important aspect in building tension. While you can make assumptions about how safe your character is when you can visually see things, only being able to hear them makes the game a whole lot scarier. Most creatures in Resident Evil can take you down in a few hits, but each of them gives off a specific ambient noise so you'll know they're there. While the game rarely puts the player in an unfair situation where they can get attacked without warning, it's still unnerving to hear those sound effects and does a great job of making the player stop and think about what could be around the corner. A free camera wouldn't really work with Resident Evil's design anyways due to how claustrophobic the level layouts are. Even if the camera was freed and put behind the player, it would probably only make the game feel worse since there are plenty of sharp turns in the many small rooms of the game. I mean, you can look at just about any room in the mansion and see that a free roaming camera would have been a nightmare for both the developers and the player. There's barely any room in the game's environments as is, so having a viewpoint that just kind of floats around like in, say, Mario or Spyro would lead to a whole lot of wall shots and close-ups. The game would have been less about fighting the undead and more about fighting with a camera. Tank controls are another aspect of design Capcom chose for Resident Evil, and much like the fixed camera, it was probably the best decision they could have made. While I've heard plenty of complaints over this style of control, where up will always make your character walk forward and left and right rotate them, it doesn't take very long to get adjusted. Top this off with the fact the camera stays in place, and it's probably a good thing your character won't change their running direction. With a camera that can change at random, it's better for your movement to remain static. In the dining room alone, there are at least five different camera angles that can change in a split second. 
If your character moved down when you were holding down instead of walking backwards, you'd probably be bumping into the table or wall every time the point of view shifted. It's not like Capcom just throws the player into the world and expects them to automatically adjust. The first item he encountered in the game is a slow and clumsy zombie that can easily be avoided, and after a few cutscenes, the player is given one very large safe room in which to practice movement. The vast majority of the enemies encountered in the first half of the game also tend to be the same slow and bumbling zombies, which gives the player more than enough time to adjust to the different control scheme. So while tank controls are a little awkward to get used to at first, there's plenty of room to actually get familiar with them. However, I did say scenario design was more than just controls, so let's talk a little bit about the baddies you can encounter throughout the mansion. Enemy placement Resident Evil is crucial because the game is all about making your way from point A to point B in the fastest way possible. The various monsters you encounter are put where they are under the guise that you have to approach from a room from one specific path, or enter from one of many different paths. Like look here, in the back part of the east side of the mansion there's a corridor with 5 potential entrances and 3-4 to four zombies depending on your scenario. Two of the entrances come from dead end, so it's impossible for the player to approach from there, and one door is locked from the inside, effectively blocking it off too. This leaves only two actual entrances. The zombies are placed in such a way that the player won't be in any real danger when they encounter them. In case of approaching from downstairs, you'll hear the zombie behind the wall moaning unless you just rush right in. As for the two above, you'll see the hallway zombie off in the distance when you go up the stairs, and in the case of the one blocking the locked door, you'll be able to hear him behind you. You can even flip-flop how this encounter works if you come into the room from the upstairs side entrance instead. See how much thought was put into this game? This is what dedicated design looks like, and it's not just this hallway either. Almost every single enemy placed in the game was put there with the similar purpose of how can we scare the player but not attack them unfairly. Probably the most interesting aspect of Resident Evil's design is its inventory system. As I stated before, both of the playable characters in Resident Evil have limited item space. They can only carry so much in their trek through the mansion. It might not sound like much, but Resident Evil is a game that revolves around puzzle solving, and it's not uncommon for there to be multiple items needed to get past a certain area of the game. Combine this with the fact that carrying a gun and ammo for it takes up two slots of your precious inventory space, and you're left with only a few spaces to hold important items like keys or medallions. To balance this out, Resident Evil has a series of storage boxes scattered across the game that are universally connected. You can store whatever you want in a box, and then take it out later in a separate box when you need it. The problem then comes down to knowing when you need it. It's both unnerving and slightly irritating to have to backtrack for an item box when you need a gun or healing item, but if you could carry everything with you in the first place then there really isn't any intention in the game now is there? Suddenly the player has to make a bunch of very important decisions. Things like, I know I need these four medallions to open up a lock ahead, but what if something jumps me and I need to heal? Or, I'm low on ammo for this weapon, but I'm not sure if I should carry another one with me. This concept is pushed even farther in Chris's scenario, where he has to carry around keys he finds lying in the mansion to open up desks to find more ammo or healing items. So now it's, I really don't have room for this spare key, but what if I miss something that's really important? The concept of the item box harkens back to Resident Evil's replayability. Once you know how the puzzles work and where the item boxes are located, it becomes a lot more fun to make your way through the various locations in the game. I've brought up replayability several times throughout this video, and I think part of what makes a game good is how many times it can be picked up and played without getting boring. There's a fine line on the balance of time and content that a game can push before it becomes tedious to play. Clocking it at anywhere between an hour and a half to four hours, all of Resident Evil's scenarios feel just right in terms of length. It doesn't get tedious, and it certainly doesn't get boring. Even if you're only playing for the campy dialogue and awkward cutscenes, the pacing of Resident Evil just feels on point. Add in a bunch of unlockables, like extra costumes and an infinite rocket launcher for beating the game in a certain amount of time. And suddenly a loop is created that makes the second playthrough more appealing. So that's pretty much it for the first Resident Evil, a game with flawed aesthetics that shines through in its gameplay. If you haven't tried it and like adventure games or campy horror movies, you'll probably enjoy it. Director's Cut is relatively cheap, being available on PSN as a PS1 classic, not to mention the myriad of other ports this game has. Regardless, Resident Evil sets a strong framework in showing how to build tension in a player through the use of ambient noise, directed camera angles, and claustrophobic level design, all while offering lasting replayability. Hey, thanks for watching my video. 
If you enjoyed it, give it a like and a share, and feel free to leave a comment of what you think about Resident Evil or my critique of it. If you want to know when I upload more videos, just click that little subscribe button down there.